I thought for this video, it would be a good chance to do a walkthrough of a channel on the Behringer XR18 or the MR18. I'll connect to channel 1 and let's get started. First, let's reset the console so we're starting with a clean baseline. Go to Setup, make sure your console is connected, then click Initialize Console. For Mixing Station, you initialize the console this way. I'm using channel 1 here. As an aside, since we reset the mixer, it should automatically be connected to the analog inputs on the front of the console. If this USB button was enabled and not grayed out, then that would mean the front panel inputs are off and the console is taking its signal from the USB inputs. That's something to check if you're ever starting a new mix without starting from scratch. If you're connecting a condenser mic or an active DI, they need a power source. Whether that is a battery in the mic or DI, or enabling phantom power so the console can provide that phantom power. You enable it here for the channel if needed. Dynamic mics and passive DIs won't require phantom power. There is also a polarity button. Single source inputs likely won't use the polarity button. But if you double mic something using two channels, and particularly with mics pointed in opposing directions, like the bottom mic of a snare, then flipping the polarity of the bottom mic is a standard practice. Flipping the polarity on that bottom mic, the mic that doesn't flow in the same direction as the other mic, will generally give you a fatter sound when the two mics are mixed together because it will mitigate the cancellations. You can set this subjectively by what sounds best to you. Plus we have a stereo link option. Use the stereo link if you have something like a stereo keyboard where you want the left and right sides to match and the faders to work together. With those housekeeping things out of the way, we now need to address the input gain. Signal flow and gain structure are two very important concepts in mixing. Fortunately, it's easy to consistently set gain by using our input meters that every channel has. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. The meters are scaled digitally. 0 dBFS is the top of the meter. Therefore, unlike an analog scale where we would set our gain to 0 dB on that meter, with several dB above zero before reaching clip. On here, if we set our gains to reach zero dB FS, we have no headroom left. There's nothing above zero. Set the gain control so that your input meter averages around minus 18 dB FS. It can and should peak higher, but should average about minus 18 dB FS. When it comes to setting the gain structure using the Mixing Station app, we have to figure out the scale of the meter. Since it's beside the fader, do we assume those fader numbers have relevance? I did a test. I fed a 1 kHz tone into the console, and I set the input to read it just under minus 15 dB FS on the Xair Edit channel meter. You can see that translates to the first yellow light on the Mixing Station's app channel meter, regardless of the fader scale. I also confirmed the clip light will light at essentially the same time as when the input level reaches 0 dB FS on the XR edit meters. What this all means in layman's terms, to set your input gain on the Mixing Station app, you need to bring the signal up into the first yellow light or so on the meter for average levels while allowing it to peak above that. Also, remember that since the gain control is the first control in the signal flow chain, you should always set it as your first step and strive to get it right so that you don't have to touch it again during the show. You also need to remember, since it is the first thing in the signal flow chain, if you change it later, it will change levels everywhere in the channel strip that follows that gain control. That means your house mix, the monitors, and stream mix will all change on that channel if you change your gain control after the show has started. Change it only when you absolutely have to, and don't continuously tweak on it during the show. On Xair Edit, if we go to the Input tab, these same settings are here. You can also see an Insert option here. It's fine as it is now, by default, and it's also redundant on this screen, so we can address this later. Next, let's look at EQ. We have our low cut, also known as a high pass filter, and we can enable and set that here. While the high pass filter can be used for sound shaping, it's typically used to remove low end content 
from below whatever your source is capable of producing. For example, a bass guitar can reach down to 40 hertz on the low E string, so setting the low cut at 40 hertz would be a good starting point. A snare drum might have very little energy below 100 hertz, so it could be set there. A standard pop vocal could maybe be 100 hertz and probably even higher. Let's move on to our EQ bands. Always remember to make sure your EQ is enabled before making changes. You can also use the enable slash disable button to compare your EQ'd signal against the un-EQ'd signal. That way you can make sure your EQ work is actually improving things. Many times, as with lots of things in mixing, less can be more. The frequency setting here is obvious, from low to high, bass to treble. You have a choice of PEQ, which is standard parametric EQ, VEQ, which is vintage EQ, which is just a different flavor of parametric, low and high cut options, and we have low and high shelving EQ options. Let's look at those first. The shelving EQ here will allow us to set a knee frequency, and a low shelf will allow us to raise or lower everything equally below that frequency. A high shelf will do just the opposite for the high side, allowing us to raise or lower everything equally above that knee frequency on the high side. Most consoles with fixed bass and treble controls are low and high shelving EQs, so you're probably already familiar with this type of EQ. Let's compare the PEQ with the VEQ. You can see the VEQ is wider than the PEQ, but both are working in similar ways. When EQing for color reasons, you typically want to use wider settings and the defaults of the VEQ or PEQ are good starting points, if not fine to leave as is if you're not comfortable experimenting. On the other hand, when EQing for feedback, you typically want more narrow surgical cuts. Surgical cuts have less impact on the overall sound while still removing those peak problem spots. You can adjust the width via the Q control on each frequency band, as you see here. On this page, there's also an RTA, real-time analyzer, that we can turn on to let us see the amplitude of the signal over the frequency range. That lets us visually see specific problem spots like feedback. Let's move over to the effects tab. By default, these four effects units are already set up for us. On the Behringer XR18, we're not normally going to be inserting things like reverb, course, or delay. They will be send and return style effects. We would insert things like a de a compressor, or the wave designer. So as it is now, by default, seeing insert grayed out and seeing off below these effects is fine. It doesn't mean the effects are off. They are simply not being used as insertion effects. They are not inserted anywhere, and that is typically what we want to see for these time-based effects. Once you're comfortable with how these work in general, you can change them to try other effects. I'll leave a link below to my effects setup, routing, and patching video that will explain things like inserts and more in depth. Okay, so now let's go to the Sins tab. By default, the first six buses are set up as post-EQ Sins. Also by default, they are routed 1 through 6 to the 6XLR aux outs on the front of the console. Anything above post fader here is also pre fader. That means these pre fader sends will not go up or down when you change the channel fader. Only post fader or subgroup will track with the channel fader. Effect sends are typically post fader, which is what these are by default. That means things like your reverb balance will stay the same even as you turn your channel fader up or down. Because being post fader, it tracks with the channel fader. On the other hand, typically you want your monitors to be pre fader. You don't typically want your monitors changing with the house channel fader. Therefore, you want to pick the monitor sends before the channel fader, pre fader. As for whether you want the monitors to be pre or post EQ, there are two schools of thought. Number one, any changes needed for the house will also be needed in the monitors. Number two, 
the monitors are better set and left alone without channel EQ changes for the house also going to the monitors. Far and away, when doing monitors from front of house, number two, pre-EQ, is the safer setting. For one thing, for number one to hold true, your monitors and house speakers need to sonically match. Also, the front of house engineer, who is also mixing monitors, cannot hear what those front of house EQ changes are doing in the monitors. Ultimately, this all can translate into feedback in the monitors. On the other hand, if you're using the console as a dedicated monitor console, then you'll want these sins to be post-EQ. You'll want that channel EQ for the monitors when it's dedicated to the monitors. When you look at this tap point chart, you can see where these settings pick the signal. I've got videos that delve more into monitor settings, tap points, and subgroups, so I'll make sure and link them in the text below so that we can keep this current video moving along. Let's look at the effects buses. We've already seen the effects rack, so we know what is in FX1 through FX4. The hall reverb is in FX2. Let's bring the channel up, make sure the main is up, and try our mic. Reverb test, hall reverb in FX2, hall reverb, up, up, reverb check, big hall reverb You can check. set any of the effects to any mic the same way. Bring up the effects send for the selected effect to the amount and you want we'll to hear. Delay. The delay is in FX3, delay up, delay, check, one, two, two three. Four, Since four. we started by initializing the console, the main effects sends and the main effects returns are already set to Unity for us. And that is the normal setting we would want. If we click over to the main tab, we can see our pan control, which is pretty obvious. Slide it to the left or right to pan the signal to the left panning or right. Panning to the left, panning to the right. You can also see the main stereo left right button. If this button is deselected and grayed out, then your signal won't be sent to the mains. You might want to do this if your band is playing to a click track, and of course you don't want that click track channel in the house sound, but do want it in your monitors. You would also want to deselect this if you're using this channel in a subgroup. The subgroup and DCA video talks about this more in depth, and I will definitely drop a link for that as well. And speaking of DCAs, we see our DCA options here. DCAs are another way to group channels to control the level of a group of channels with one fader. You can assign a channel to a DCA by selecting the DCA that you want to use here. There is also the auto mix setting here. Auto mixing is for conference type mixing. It is not for band mixing, so it's not going to put us out of business. And it's not really mixing per se. You still have to set up your channels just like we've been discussing in this video. Auto mix will help to track unused open mics and raise and lower volume as more or less mics are used on the conference panel. There's essentially two auto mix groups available, an X group and a Y group. Unless you have two specific groups of mics in use, you'll likely just need to use one group for a typical conference or panel discussion. Let's go on to the comp screen. The XR and the MR have some presets here that you can use to simplify things. For the presets to work as intended, it's another reason to get your input gain correct as described at the start of this video. Our signal flow chain is taking us from there to here. When you use one of these settings and see the setting has makeup gain added, which in this case is 6 dB, that is telling you to adjust the threshold so that your gain reduction meter is averaging 6 dB of gain reduction. If there's no makeup gain added, then adjust the gain reduction so that the compression is lighter and just attacking the peaks. If you're familiar with using compression, this works just like any other compressor. You typically want a slow attack for percussive instruments. Experiment with an even slower attack on the snare than what this preset is using. In all cases, pay attention to what your gain reduction meter is showing you and listen to what the compressor is doing. Don't overdo it and let it suck the life out of the signal. Now let's look at the gate setting. You're most likely to use gates on the drums. These days, gates aren't necessarily used to shorten the sound or ringing of toms, although they certainly can do that. 
They can be used to gate out the stage wash from the band and to keep other drums out of each individual drum mic. A gate will open on the drum when the drum is hit and then ramp back down to close as the drum sound naturally fades away. Once again, the X-Air gives us some presets. And those presets will likely work best if you set the gain properly to begin with. But still, your source signal will matter, so don't be surprised if the presets need tweaking. Maybe a lot of tweaking. The gates work just like any other gates, but they give you a lot more control than many basic gates. Try not to set the threshold too tight. The drummer should be able to play normally and open the gates. Adjust the threshold, not the drummer. If anything, the attack can be quicker for drums. The hold and release will take experimentation and experience to set and really fine tune. Threshold sets the level required to open the gate. Attack is how quickly it opens. Hold is how long it stays fully open. Release is how long it takes to attenuate the signal from fully open to fully closed, much like a fade out. I'm not a fan of gates on vocals, but you'll notice the preset actually switches into expansion mode for the vocal preset. Expansion is generally better than a simple gate for vocals. Don't be surprised though if it takes work to get a usable setting or never finding a setting for vocals that is actually better than just off. These gates also have a filter setting. For example, when you click on the kick or the snare preset, notice they have a filter setting that is turned on. Essentially, only audio within that filter's range will open the gate. You can use and fine tune these for your own drums and other sources. You can make it so that the thud or boom of a drum opens the gate, but not the clack of the attack of the stick or beater. What that means is the ting of a cymbal or crack of the snare is out of that frequency range and won't open the tom or kick gates. At least when it's dialed in properly, and that will vary from drum to drum. We're just talking about one input here, but if you want to see a video that talks about the patch order for an entire band, check out this video. I'm going to leave several links to videos about mixing in the text below, so check those out. If you like information like this, please like and subscribe to the channel. Affiliate links in the Patreon page link are in the text below to support the channel. Check out the other channel videos. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.